I'm very happy to greet everybody here in the audience. Welcome to our webinar, which is the second webinar we do as part of the pre-conference process with the Metropolis uh, Conference in September in Berlin. And this is our second webinar, which looks on the nexus between climate change and migration and mobility. And we have a working group, a pre-working group working on this topic, and we are excited about having some of the members of this pre-working group with us and uh, speaking and others we have invited. We, um, I want to say welcome in the name of the networking unit at Technical University Berlin and the task force of Metropolis of the Ministry for, of Labor and Social Affairs. So even more people are coming in. Anyway, we, we are going to start. What are we going to talk about today? Infrastructures. So what are we speaking about? And if you have a look at the World Migration Report, which was out just a couple of days ago, infrastructures are mentioned. And that is remarkable because normally we do not speak about infrastructures too much. We speak about individual migrants, about decisions, expectations, but not about infrastructures. And I think it's the right way to go. So uh, what is meant here? And the report says the existence of migration infrastructures or the lack thereof is an important factor in migration outcomes with migration infrastructure defined as diverse human and non-human elements that enable and shape migration. And we might ask, hinder migration also. And then the report, when it comes to climate change, says we must look on slow onset processes and on how climate resilient, uh, climate proof community infrastructure is built. So migrant infrastructure would be one thing we could speak about. It is not precisely what we are. We have decided to speak about. We will speak about the built infrastructure and what this built infrastructure means in terms of migration and mobility. And we look on the traveling concepts going along with those infrastructures. So let me give you some pictures on what we are speaking about. We speak, for example, about this blue and green infrastructures. So on the effects of climate change, um, which, are, uh, which are mitigated or hope to be mitigated by the help through the help of uh, infrastructures such as dams, sea defenses or polders also. Um, and here you see an example of a sea defense. You can see here this stone blocks um, at the Gulf of Guinea. This is Kita in Ghana, south to Accra. So that would be an example of a blue infrastructure you see here. You can see another example that's been a plan. I, I'm not sure if that has been done for Simerang, which is a city in northern Java. And I'm pleased we have one representative of the Diponegori University here. So what you can see here is a, is a huge infrastructure that should span 15 kilometers in the Bay of Simerang, hoping to regulate in a way, in a way climate sea level. So this is built infrastructure we are speaking about. We are speaking about uh, dams, for example, which have been en vogue in the 50s and 60s, but then have been uh, somewhat um, stopped in there. There was a stop on building, but now it's going, it's going on again. So we have many dams coming up in Africa, all over the world. We speak about such green infrastructure. So the attempts to regulate the floodings, for example. And here you see again, Semoang and uh, so we want to know about this blue and green infrastructures. How do they impact on migration patterns and mobilities? What is the content of our webinar today? So we speak about the development of such infrastructures as part of resilience strategies and for climate adaptation. We speak about the way they relate to migration, we speak about resettlement, expulsion, climate gentrification. So new words, new com concepts coming up. And then we speak about how infrastructures are hoped or can help people to stay in place and sometimes even attract newcomers. Our questions are on the knowledge, the way the knowledge on blue and green infrastructures is traveling all around the world. And what are climate related strategies that are implemented regionally? And then 
we look on the consequences and side effects in a way of the large infrastructures concerning migration and the daily life of people, for example, in Indonesia. The, our focus here is on coastal areas in Indonesia, in Bangladesh, Northern Germany, and in the Netherlands. And I now present you, I introduce you into our speakers, which are brilliant, excellent. I'm absolutely excited. We have first Mrs. Professor Vivandari Handayani from, Uni from Un Universitas di Ponegore in Semarang, Indonesia. I just mentioned it's Java, so it's the big, the biggest island of the thousands of uh, Indonesian islands. And she's a, she's a great expert on resilience and urban development. She's the, at present the dean, the head of the faculty of um, planning. So hello, Vivi. I'm pleased to see you here. We have hello. then Johannes Herbeck. He's at ATEC, the Center for Sustainability at the University of Bremen. Hello, Johannes. And we have Shanoa Hassan. She is at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and she's working about Bangladesh since quite some time. Exciting work also here. And we have uh, Mr. Professor Dr. Simon Richter from the University of Pennsylvania. He's also part of the Penn Program in Environmental Humanities USA, and you will see in a moment what this means. Um, all of the speakers have a certain focus, so how we how we do this, what is the shape, the form of our webinar. And we want you to be involved into our webinar as much as possible because we think it's important to speak about these things. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes. And then we have hopefully in the end a 50 min 15 minutes uh, question and answers and discussion session. So our speakers will concentrate on different aspects. Vivandari Handayani will focus on the way cities set up infrastructures to become more resilient against climate change. Mr. Habeck will give in insights into ethnographic work on the mobility of concepts and blue urbanism and infrastructures. Um, Dr. Hassan will look on the consequences of large infrastructures, polar, on, day on the daily life of uh, people living in Bangladesh. And Mr. Richter will, in the end, will show us a short video, also a movie. So he will speak about the narrative, and I'm excited to give the floor to Vivandari Handayani first. Vivi, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Professor Hillman, for giving me the opportunity to share an experience from Indonesia, particularly from Java. And I would like to directly uh, start and take the opportunity to uh, connect uh, the three important terms and how we can see the phenomenon in uh, Java, Indonesia. So there are the three terms uh, connecting the issues of urbanization, climate change, and how it relates to the infrastructural development that has been uh, constructing in the last uh, decade yeah, to deal with the climate change impact in Java. I would like to uh, first start with the urbanization issues. So maybe uh, Professor Hillman has mentioned earlier that when we talk about Indonesia, actually Java is not the biggest island, <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, Jaffa has the most yeah, of the people uh, out of Indonesia. So if you can imagine, uh, maybe Jaffa Island is only about less than 10% uh, of the whole uh, Indonesia area. Uh, and uh, please keep in mind, it keeps sinking in the northern part because of the climate change. But the number of populations consists of about 60% of the whole Indonesian people. So you can imagine uh, how dense is the Java compared to the other islands yeah, uh, in uh, Indonesia. And the phenomenon uh, getting challenging because uh, it is followed by the rapid urbanization experienced by this country. As you can see uh, on the slide, uh, if in uh, 2010, we already have uh, 
almost 50% of the people live in city and most of the people live in Java, it increased almost 60 and even expected 70% of the people will live in cities, um, uh, saying that uh, we live in a very dense area uh, and uh, it becomes quite challenging because most of the big cities uh, across the country is located in the coastal area because uh, earlier uh, the cities developed as the commercial trading close to the port and so on and creating a bigger city located in the coastal compared to the inland where actually the climate change impact uh, experience even even more yeah, in the latest uh, years even uh, i just uh, came from the one city uh, earlier today from pakalongan which, which uh, just experienced a very a bad uh, tidal flood uh, compared to the last 10 years yeah in the area and actually when we talk about climate change impact in indonesia it's not only related to the what we call as uh, water related or climate disasters that likely to increase such as tidal flood, drought and so on, but also threatening what uh, the ecosystem biodiversity, even health se sectors creating the climate change in Indonesia becomes a multi uh, sectoral issues that uh, to be addressed. And as you can see in the next slide, I would like to a little bit emphasizing uh, the environmental concern because at the moment, as you can see from the slide, most of the rapid development experienced only on the northern coast on the island. So as I have mentioned earlier, out of the 100% of the total population, 60% of the total population live on the island, on Java. Yeah. And out of the 60% of the people live only on the northern part of the Java island. So you can imagine how dense it is. And uh, it experienced very rapid urbanization while the many cities along the northern coast also experienced many related climate uh, disaster such as coastal erosion, uh, tidal inundation and so on in addition to another uh, issue such as land subsidence so you can imagine all the cities experience from the sea side uh, they experience the sea level rise and from the land side it explains the land subsidence because of many reasons one of the reasons is because the water extraction yet yeah, because of people is likely to grow rapidly and they need water for 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 their and uh, it becomes the environmental situation along the coast becomes uh, becomes uh, very how to say I want I don't want to say worse but uh, faced with so many uh, environmental uh, issues. What I would like to uh, highlight a little bit is the incidents only just. A couple of days ago, uh, maybe last week, yeah, it's maybe about on Friday or Saturday, uh, there's a quite a big uh, flooded yeah, uh, in, in Semarang and also Pekalongan. As you can see, this is the, uh, the, the, the map showing the um, central Java uh, and the northern part of the central Java. Uh, the, the red dot uh, is showing the cities yeah, along the coast in central Java and well, two of the cities that experience quite bad uh, climate change disaster is Semarang and Pekalongan. Semarang is the capital of the uh, central Java province with more uh, than one and a half million population, while Pekalongan is uh, quite smaller with about 200,000 uh, people and some of them rely on also a fishery sector. And uh, as you, I tried to show some picture happening just last week that, for example, in Pekalongan uh, experienced quite heavy flooded, uh, causing quite sick uh, damage. Uh, as you can see at uh, the last data, 200, more than 200 people were displaced and the water had reached 
almost one meter is about 90 centimeters even in Samarang it's it never really happened before the dike close to the port is so it is in a very strategic location close to the port and also close to many offices industrial zone and suddenly the dikes was broken and creating quite significant damage uh, with 122 house a lot of families uh, were affected by the tidal flood and even the water uh, head reaches uh, almost or uh, around 1.5 uh, meters showing that actually even though uh, the government have tried to do a lot of infrastructural work but we we never know the the impact could just happen uh, the flooded come from the sea because of the tidal flood but also the flood from the upstream uh, area also happened because of the changing uh, water cycle and it creates more pressure in addition to the high urbanization uh, taking place in the area and it's just happening in the situation where actually there have been quite rapid urban activities uh, and we can see or it is really a great challenge how this rapid urban activity that actually needed to promote economic growth create more and more what we call as coastal vulnerability i just want to give you a brief idea how actually there are various urban activity that are happening across the northern coast of java not only port and various industrial that <clears throat> most of them also extract water creating more issue in land subsidence but also there are many uh, fishery kampung yeah slum area along the coast that most of the local people very much rely on the sea and uh, fishery sectors they are likely to embed it yeah with the area and uh, really want to stay because they really live uh, and need to live close to the sea other than slum area, it is also interesting to know the slum area could be neighboring into the luxury housing and settlement. And you can see uh, this situation in, uh, in different cities, yeah, including maybe in our capital city in Jakarta. And uh, to maintain uh, the development of the coastal city, also the government put some uh, construction work, dike construction, highway construction, reclamation, and so on to promote as well, not only the effort to maintain or to slower the climate change impact, but also at the same time uh, to promote economic growth uh, in the area. So it is really a challenge actually to meet the balance between how we can maintain the the ecological system the maintain the balance of the environment with the fact that also it be, it already becomes a strategic area for uh, economic growth uh, for the country and not only for the island because there are so many people live there there have been a lot of infrastructural investment being done there have been a lot of infrastructural work in different ways seawall polder system and so on as you can see i tried to find some picture just to give you an idea how various intervention has been done so far and it has been also a lot of plan to be done in the future for for just for an example yeah in semarang we have some program we call uh, water as leverage try to have a comprehensive uh, initiative to deal with the climate change by promoting some uh, upstream and downstream program uh, expecting that we can deal with this uh, different uh, climate change impact and hoping creating a more livable settlement along the coast um, just to make it brief yeah because i believe uh, we have many other presenters and i would like to continue uh in the discussion side in this uh, presentation i just want to give a brief idea how actually uh, the urbanization and economic growth has been uh, 
has been performing so far in northern Java and at the same time the area in certain especially in the certain uh, growth center also experience uh, the environmental pressure and there is an urgent need actually for for all of the related stakeholders to create what I call as an enabling environment and building a capacity for long-term implementation. That is why I put this, the, the, I like to highlight how we can move uh, to create not only an adaptation for the short term, construct uh, something, build something, but we need to transform to involve uh, different stakeholders to create a coalition among different stakeholders, not only uh, promote the construction work and promoting more economic growth in the area, but how we need also to accommodate the need uh, and provide livable and sustainable region by securing what I call as integrated and sustainable climate initiative. And as Bu Felicitas has mentioned earlier, that maybe um, the construction, the infrastructural development uh, will in some way maintain the economic growth, maintain the people to live there, but somehow it will very high cost. Yeah. We need to a long-term solution uh, to invite uh, people to go to other places and uh, give uh, reduce the pressure uh, in the environment along the, the coast that uh, at the moment already sinking and become a great challenge actually for the future of Jaffa and for the future of Indonesia. I think I will stop here, Bu Felicitas. I hope I'm not running out of the time, not too long, and I hope this can lead us to a further discussion. And thank you for giving me the time, and uh, I give the time back to you, Bu Felicitas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivi, for your presentation, which shows us how urbanization, economic growth, and other issues come into the picture. Our next speaker is Johannes, I guess, right? Just go ahead, please. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? All good, yes. all good. Okay. Go ahead, we we'll see you and your um, presentation. Yeah, Excuse me. Um, Felicitas for having me and um, hello to everyone. Um, I'm going to show you some of the starting points of a, of a pro project that I'm currently working on and also some results that we, that we derived from earlier phases of, of a project or a forerunner of the project. So the, the current project is called Blue Urban, Towards Blue Urbanism for Sea Level Change Adaptation, Global Trajectories and Speculative Futuring in Island Southeast Asia. Um, I think the focus that we have is not so much on the, on the relation, uh, relations between infrastructural development and migration, but we are interested in, in different forms of mobilities that come with infrastructure development, especially um, the mobility of knowledge of technologies and how they come to place in in the actual adaptation projects um so for and some reason i'm not able to scroll forward now oh no okay so what what we are interested in so first of all uh, the work that we currently carry carry out is is embedded in an earlier um, german science foundation funded project immersa that looked at the kinds of ideas and recipes uh, for living with or also against sea level change, uh, what we call climate solutionism, how are those ideas or political interest. Uh, our focus was on the diverse cities of Jakarta, Metro Manila and Singapore, together with, with many partners. And when going there and looking at the kinds of infrastructure solutions that you find in those places, it's not surprising that these solutions are often hinged uh, on the emphasis on grand infrastructural projects um, and are often uh, expert driven. Um, for example, with Dutch, Japanese or Danish consultancies that come into play. 
Um, but we also see that those blueprints, those ideas that are often brought to those places, uh, they go through changes and that the, the flow is not um, unidirectional. Um, now for the second phase, we are concentrating on blue urbanism as a concept, also as a lens to show a general paradigm shift um, towards integrating urban planning and everyday life of coastal cities with ocean, with the oceans that they are surrounded by. Um, and with this background, we focus on imaginaries, on policies, but also practices of futuring cities that are placed in delta situations or along coasts and we're there thereby we are very much interested in the in the genesis, genesis and the material changes uh, but also broader socio-cultural circulations uh, and politics around two two very concrete infrastructures uh, that we focus on um i will show you um in a minute and but in this concentration of the uh, in those two technologies, we want to analyze the global networks of those innovations um, that evolve around them, and we want to follow them from the sites where they are developed to places of circulation, and then to the actual implementation into projects. So the the technologies that we are interested in um, are on the one hand multifunctional dikes or super dikes. And on the other, on the, on the other hand, floating structures and artificial islands. And as I said, we are interested in those different, what we call discursive spaces, those different sites that I've just mentioned, uh, sites of innovation that could, for example, be university re research groups or labs, um, where those technologies are developed. Uh, sites of circulations could be fairs, trade fairs, for example, summits, conferences, where, where there's an exchange of knowledges and ideas. And then finally, the site, sites of adaptation, where we see the local um, projects that evolve out of it. And going through those sites, we're interested in both the discourse carriers, uh, which, which we mean um, the different actors and actor constellations in which those knowledge uh, circulations are realized. Um, and end in the epistemic channels, pathways and structures of flows of information. For example, the way knowledge is promoted through workshops, through study travels that you find quite often, but also newsletter newsletters of international donor organizations and something like that. Um, so we started our research um, shortly before the pandemic um, um, happened. And of course, this changed a lot, but we were able to start uh, with a small research visit to um, um, to a lab or a research group in the Netherlands at TU Delft that had, had been looking at the idea of multifunctional dikes over a couple of years. Um, an idea that is probably not that new, but um, it was really pushed and and intensified through this group. And already by going there, we realized that there are, of course, a strong uh, strong interrelations and connections to other places. Um, both pictures are from there. And, and you see that the connection, for example, to Singapore are quite obvious here. We also went to Deltares, uh, Netherlands, uh, the, the Dutch uh, Water Institute that is very instrumental in promoting some of the, the Dutch technologies in water um, management and, and climate adaptation as well. And, and it's, it's clear that they are interested in, in promoting new, new practices also in the field of multifunctional flood defenses. And they allow that this, of course, happens on different levels, laws, but they are also focusing on how, how really to combine and optimize different values within certain occasions, also closely related to what Vivi just said, to create livable uh, places, increase the livability of the dike for the people that live there, but also in the hinterlands. And we also went to some of the pilot projects uh, in the Netherlands on the left-hand side, that's Katwijk on sea, where you find a combination of a dike with a parking garage. On the right-hand sa side is the Scheveningen Boulevard, where you have uh, a more a tourist um, spot combined with with um, with flood defense. 
Also for the second uh, technology that we look at, the floating structures, we, we found a lot of examples. This is uh, the upper photograph is from Rotterdam, where there's a, a venue that is created, uh, that is placed into the harbor of Rotterdam, uh, the city harbor, not, not the, the large, with the, with the large vessels. And you see that there are, there are a lot of pilot projects and testing grounds of some of, some of those technologies. Um, the the observations that we did in Southeast Asia are older observations. Um, we're just about to to um, to go on a first uh, field trip in in June. Um, so what you what I present now are a more older uh, findings that we that come from the first phase of the project. Um, but it's clear that for uh, that urban coasts in Southeast Asia, there are sites of hydrosocial intervention for decades and, and centuries. Um, when looking at the, some of those places, you see a succession of different planning and also development mantras um, that of course have changed over time, but, but that uh, have really changed the coasts uh, massively. Uh, like the newest spin, uh, I would say on the what we observed, is a transfer from risk to incentive driven interventions, something that we call speculative futuring. Um, and some of the projects, I, I think they speak their own language and already explain uh, what we mean by that. When looking at the three cities that we've concentrated in those, this first phase, um, first you see similarities, of course, um, a lot of um, sim um, hard infrastructure solutions that dominated or for a long time at least dominated um, the coastal development pathways of those cities and also uh, the, the adaptation pathways that that, uh, that those cities uh, take. For example, disaster risk reduction um, in Manila, the master plan comes with heavy infrastructure, the NCICD project in Jakarta, uh, similar to, to what Vivi showed from from Samarang, a large-scale infrastructure solution, and also Singapore has taken uh, similar trajectories. When you now look into the international involvement or the flows of knowledge that come to those cities, but also evolve between those cities, um, you see also similarities. For example, the, the Deltaris Institute that I've mentioned before is more or less active in all three cities and has, for example, in Manila, really um, taken the lead in, in much of the infrastructural solutions that are proposed to the cities. And they they were also involved in the NCICD and the, and the Singapore adaptation pathway. So you really see a, a field of experts that go to those cities and propose similar solutions. Um, but those solutions do play out uh, differently on the ground. What you see here is a is a presentation from a presentation of the um, Bapenas in Jakarta, the the National Development um, Authority, and um, they kind of translated what was proposed by the by the Dutch consultancies into into different um, options that that were possible and. Um, also on the ground, you would find a lot of objections to to those large um, uh, infrastructure development, but also to the international involvement in it. On on the probably on less political levels, you also see that of course there are a lot of um, smaller acts of adaptation that are. Um, that are happening at the same time, uh, also in parallel, and often then also in contrast to the to the larger infrastructure um, projects. And so this is something that we want to um, to really intensify in the second phase to also see what what different forms of of local knowledge. Um, this is an, uh, a practice that is called nimbun self reclamation um, that make terra aqueous grounds. So how those ideas then are probably taken up by 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 other other um, places and and circulated uh, similar to what what we see in those elite or uh, expert driven discourses. To come to a quick conclusion, you also see, of course, there's a multi multiplicity of uh, different um, views on the coast. Uh, um, 
Vivi also showed how how different aspirations also are connected with with certain um, ideas of how coast should be developed. And there are, of course, um, different polarities that that play out here. So on the first, on the one side, the dry versus the watery territory making that we see, for example, in in Indonesia, also the dystopian versus the utopic imaginaries that are brought into play here. The difference between marginality and affluence at the same time um, that also leads to coastal centeredness versus peripheralization at the at the same time. And of course, what is quite obvious, also the difference between the grand projects, the gentrification aspects. Felicitas men mentioned climate gentrification versus the more everyday practices, for example, in Nimbun of survival and transgression. And I'd like to thank you and stop here. Thank you very much. We saw the bird, the Garuda bird. Was that the Garuda project in Jakarta we saw yes. on the map? Yeah. Thank you so much, Johannes. And you can see me. I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, which is Shanoa Hassan, and she speaks about Bangla Bangladesh. And I saw already a polder picture. Please, Shanoa, go ahead. Thank you, Felicitas. My story um, kind of uh, sets in a similar context that Vivi and Johannes was pointing out when it comes to development. And um, most often, I see that the international donor-funded water development programs, which are originated in the global north, imagine development uh, based on specific ideas of growth and modernity. And their ideas promote common solutions for all and uh, to achieve some common growth, progress, and improvement. And this sort of ideas hinges on specific predetermined notions of what development is and should be for all. And by doing this, this perspective uh, considers equity and societal and environmental justice as given in the terms of like that something that happens synergistically alongside in the implementation of the development intervention or because of the imagined or expected improvements. So my, I focus on to the stories, research stories, that is um, uh, part of this ongoing research project titled uh, Tidal Water Custodian, funded by the World Bank, ironically, uh, under the South Asian um, care program, which is climate adaptation and resilience. So I try to, I'm, I'm still making um, sense of what I have seen and understood and learned from uh, the field work that have been recently done jointly with the team. So um, with what I was trying to, going back to what I was trying to say about this common develop, uh, notion development ideas is that this form of development has transformed the Southeast Asian coastal regions into spaces for hydraulic engineering structural experimentations, as Vivi and Johannes also talked about. And I would like to discuss today, does this way of imagining development for the coastal areas in the global south actually help better deal with water? And what are the possible consequences or benefits of these imaginaries for future or for development for in, in, in addressing climate challenges? Being a Bangladeshi, uh, I would like to focus on uh, a case of the polarization in the southwestern Bangladesh. And uh, perhaps most of you know that polarization um, is, an, is a Dutch innovation, historical Dutch innovation that, the, that uh, has successfully kept the Netherlanders to keep their feet dry. So how this polder promise happened? So before we talk about the structural intervention, we need to understand how this idea of coastal embankment project or the Polder Promise emerged. The project uh, was proposed by the US funded uh, study carried out by United Nations, which was known as Krug Mission. Krug was the guy who led this project and the study, uh, the mission identified construction of Dutch dikes as essential for development for the Delta in Bangladesh. The recommended um, this recommendation resulted in the creation of state engineering agency, now um, known as the Bangladesh Water Development Board, 
to overtake water management responsibilities implemented in the project. Excuse me, do you have, we don't see a presentation. Didn't you have a presentation? Oh, I do have. Unfortunately. No, it. Yeah. Oh, sorry for this technical <laughs> glitch. No problem. But, We are listening. Oh, thanks. <laughs> sorry again. Um, so, what I was trying to say is that uh, the, this recommendation resulted in the creation of the Bangladesh Water Development Board. And if you. Um, look into or analyze the interest of this project, you see that uh, this Gulf Boulder promise actually formed part of a paradigm shift in which the development actors uh, from the global north, at that time known as the Western donors, uh, formed strategic alliances to operate state-led capital intensive projects by casting advanced technology, the ideas of agricultural production, urbanization, Uh, in what they identified as underdeveloped post-colonial societies. Uh, and in those projects, they tend to employ mainly their own engineering consultants. So uh, you see a bunch of Dutch uh, consultants, um, expert engineers in this project who has very little or almost no ideas of the uh, river morphology or the, how the, the culture, the society, how it works in the Bangladesh. And um, at that time in the 1960s, Bangladesh was uh, part of the Pakistan. It was known as East Pakistan. And the interest for the central Pakistani government, which was dominated by the West Pakistanis, was that uh, the coastal, this boulder promise could become a means to increase the agricultural production, the food production in the fertile lands of now Bangladesh to provide foods for their Urdu-speaking population, not to the Bangladeshis. So with this interest, when the boulder uh, was implemented, it, it happened uh, through several, uh, through ignoring several criteria, including um, the engineers or the in actors involved ignored the negative impacts and lessons learned from the construction of the watertight embankments during the British period. And um, so it can be said that the Dutch polarization in Bangladesh is a repetition of the past colonial mistakes that over time has actually exacerbated the environmental degradation um, in the Delta. And this polar promise also happened, as I mentioned, with no regard to water ma management knowledge and practices of the people in the Delta that they were practicing over centuries through generations after generations. For example, Uh, the people living in the Delta were adopted with two full tidal cycles a day. They identify three types of floods. They know how to live with that. And um, in mid-January, each year during mid-January, four to five people from each household will, would uh, organize themselves to construct temporary earthen dikes on the sides of floodplain to protect against saltwater intrusion in the dry season. And in mid-August, they breach those dikes um, along the various canals connected to the river uh, to uh, uh, prevent monsoon uh, floods so that they can irrigate their rice crops. So the refer to this intervention as Jor Bhattar Kalanu in Bangla, which literally means in English, the free play of tidal flow. So you can see even from the names that this uh, people in living in the Delta know how to live with water, tidal, fresh, fresh water tidal flow in their everyday life. And later, this um, knowledge was institutionalized by the government of Bangladesh at the Tidal River Management. The part of this I would come back to later. So what happened? Um, in, uh, here you can see the map of the uh, coastal belt in Bangladesh. The immediate impacts of the postal prom uh, promise where polar promise was quite uh, positive. It um, increased agricultural production. It attracted uh, people to migrate into the area because of uh, this economic, economic growth. However, the Southwestern Delta, this part, was severely affected because of the fact that the colonial mistakes were repeated they were, or disregarded. Um, the river morphology the geo the, uh, were, were disregarded, the local knowledge were disregarded, and it resulted in dead or dying up of rivers, um, siltation uh, uh, co caused by the siltation of riverbeds, 
and deeper and longer lasting waterlogging floods, which uh, took uh, at times more damaging tarn than the monsoon floods in the Mangla, in, in that part, southwestern part. So to talk about the current landscape or how this boulder promise has transformed the landscape, I would like to take you into this part of the delta, the southwestern part of the delta in the Shapkira district. I would talk about, I would, we would try to see the landscape through the eyes of three people living in the three uh, different floodplains. Let me start the story with Hasina. When I, uh, uh, I don't, uh, unfortunately, I do not have a picture of Hasina because she was a bit um, um, timid about, uh, or, or not comfortable enough me taking her picture because she has talked so much that she thinks maybe uh, uh, become problematic for her. So, um, Hasina, what Hasina told me is that um, she leaves, she and her family and the neighbors live in knee deep water for three to four months ever since the river that where uh, she lives on the other side of the bank has been silted and it has been almost for 20 years. In her estimation, 75 men from the seven, almost 75% of the households in her village had to migrate um, for earning a livelihood. Her husband works in another coastal region area named Barisal as an agricultural labor and sends money by mobile banking. And it, of course, uh, creates an impact on the family bonding, the, her children being raised without seeing the father in day to day life. The water logging um, has also increased the household cost, living cost for the family. They had to buy drinking water. It is not easy to maintain personal and family hygiene and also maintaining hygiene during menstruation, during the water logging uh, condition that lasts for three to four months. The cell, here you can see the salinity residues uh, during the water logging leaves mar, uh, uh, sorry, uh, causes the brick to become weakened. And here you can see the mark of the level of the uh, uh, water during the water logging. And there is a notion that only the poor or less advantaged households are more affected, but what Hasina uh, from this water logging floods, but what Hasina told me that this is not, this is no longer the case. Now the uh, affluent people, for example, the shrimp farm owners are equally affected because during the water logging, what happens is that nobody knows who's a uh, fish from uh, uh, where the fishes from one ship shrimp farms farms are going. Um, so it, it is a loss also for the shrimp farm owners. And Athena also, um, with a deep sigh, she expressed uh, that how this has uh, caught this water logging has impacted on the vegetation. For example, she mentioned that um, growing up, she had um, access to different fruits, including mango, plum, guavas, etc., planted by her grandparents or in-laws of uh, once she was in, she came to this village almost 13 years ago. But for her own children, she can't plant any fruit trees in the saline water. The most of the trees around she or the fruits that she, her family could get are the coconuts. And also the growth of the coconut trees are not healthy. You can see it in the trunks of the trees and identify um, when this, this trunk were growing in the saline level, uh, saline periods or waterlogging periods. And I asked Hasina, how has the river Moricha became like what Hasina Khatun was describing? She said it's because the Jorbhat or Kala or the fresh water tidal flow has been disrupted and the siltation has increased the riverbeds and the water has died. As she mentioned that as the river died, so, do, so did we. And I, and I asked her, are you aware or familiar about the ongoing dredging activities of the river on the other side of the bank? She said, yes, but no, because I could see it, but nobody ever in my 13 years of life uh, living in this village after I get, got married to my husband came and asked what I really want or we want, or we think could help the river 
uh, survive. She, she and her neighbors were skeptical about the effectiveness of this dredging. They think it would last only two to three years, as have been the cases for the other uh, dredging activities or projects in the, reef, uh, in the surrounding area. Moving on, close next to, the, uh, to another flood plain area, the least lady, um, known with her family name Sharker, she was telling a similar, she was depicting a similar picture where she uh, said that 35 years ago, this used to be a river, and she came to this village after she was married off on a boat, and now this is a dead river. In 2009, the river was dredged. It lasted, the impacts of the dredging lasted for two to three years before it died again. Now, on, at the time when I visited her in March, there were dredging activities going on. But she was not too, uh, she was also skeptical like Hasina. Moving on to the next river, to the, another floodplain. This guy is Gafur. Um, as the water logging uh, increased, the rivers were dying. The um, residents in the delta were getting frustrated. They wanted to make a change. They were breaching the dikes, which is considered a legal offense. Um, but due to the mass protest and, and the ongoing um, struggle, the government of the Bangladesh institutionalized the tidal river management, which, is, which builds on the local knowledge. And uh, they implemented the TRM, more commonly known as TRM, in several wetlands. And uh, Gafur lives in one of, uh, is, as a beneficiary, lives in one of those wetland area or TRM implemented land. However, Gafur no longer finds that TRM uh, beneficial because um, when implementing the TRM, the one of the part and parcel is the compensation packages for the uh, people living uh, who are donating the land to implement the TRM. Gafur received compensation packages for uh, two, the first two years with help of local NGOs, but he's yet to receive the three other remaining packages. So although Gafur is uh, one of the most, inf uh, uh, belongs to affluent household in this uh, TRM area, he's being a farmer, a trader, he owns a shop in the village market, but he thinks it is becoming problematic because he hasn't received his money, which was his rights. However, asthma, another beneficiary of tidal river management, is happy with TRM because he she received the compensation in the form of a house. However, she is she feels socially discriminated because she had to migrate to this tidal river management village, which was built with the funds of, with support from the, the Bangladesh government and some uh, development funds from Germany. Um, once migrated, she, she was looked upon by her neighbors as outsider in her own coastal region. And she had to migrate because her village and her house went underwater during the construction of the tidal river management. So with these stories, the point I want to make is that the, this large scale infrastructure that perhaps helped to maintain aid flow in the go, uh, global south, uh, here in this case, Bangladesh, or maintain strategic alliances, development cooperation. Um, however, it transformed the coastal landscapes in Bangladesh in a way that the people living in the adjacent flood basins no longer um, uh, flood basins experience the uh, impacts of the polder differently. And that means that you, this idea of common solutions, common growth no longer works for them. So you may wonder, uh, are the development actors listening? I do not know really, because um, there is another project that has been going on. Uh, it, you can call it the Polder Promise 2.0 because it's called it's the same development actors, the Dutch, the World Bank. Um, they call it Coastal Embankment Improvement Project. And if you ask them what is the motivation and interest for this continuation of polderization, they would say to rehabilitate the embankment and to raise the embankment height to combat high tides and storm surges in the context of climate challenges. So with this, 
going back to the question that I posed at the beginning, is this helpful for this uh, global South? Definitely the interest to support are genuine. That's what I would like, I believe. The long-term impacts, however, are limited as the development programs tend to simplify uh, the complexities and strips out the social and cultural practices and knowledges at context to resolve the differences and make things appear as neutral and universal. This approach of development often exacerbates environmental risks and the vulnerability of the people and resulting in un uneven growth and inequality. So what are the possible consequences of this way of developing um, in when it comes to the climate challenges? The impacts and associated risks un uh, undoubtedly un attribute to the prevailing climate impacts in the Delta. Uh, so it is, I believe it's important to recognize these differences in interest, context and practices in uh, development uh, for meaningful development. And to conclude, I would like to um, take you to this picture. Uh, I would take only 30 seconds more. This was a dead river. It was, it, it was revived through tidal river management. And when it was dead, this bridge that you could see was constructed. So what a way, what a, I don't know what thoughts went into uh, developing, a con uh, constructing a bridge in, on a dead river. The river is sinking, uh, silting up again and on the verge of dying. So I don't know when this fisherman would be able to uh, fly through this river again. Thank you. Thank you very much for your speech, uh, Shandor. Very interesting. We are likely to run out of time, but I think we give it a, some extra time. And I would like to invite Simon now to share his thoughts with us. Thank okay, you. right. Um, I will be brief, but I will also show you a video. Um, I think it'll Wait. come in certainly under 10 minutes. Um, you'll have noticed that in the previous three talks, uh, the Netherlands came up a bit. Um, I'm going to talk about the Netherlands. Uh, Shanur asked, um, are these developers listening? Um, even in the Netherlands, they're not listening to themselves. The Netherlands is the victim of its own success. Their world-renowned Delta Works and their energetic self-branding as experts in adapting to sea level rise have lulled many Dutch people, including the government, into the false belief that there's little reason for concern. Despite the fact that the IPCC's sixth assessment says that two meters of sea level rise by 2100 and five meters by 2150 cannot be ruled out, the Dutch government plans to build 1 million new housing units by 2130, 80% of them in vulnerable areas. That is well below sea level, up to seven meters below or in floodplains. A handful of adaptation experts, designers, journalists, and isolated policymakers, including the Delta Commissioner, have called on the government to reorient its approach and avoid dangerous lock-ins. But even they hardly dare to say out loud what common sense suggests. A moratorium on building new housing in vulnerable areas and incentives for building on higher ground in order to stimulate relocation, essentially a form of managed retreat and new mobilities. This is necessary. Just last week, the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization said, quote, this game is already lost. Even with a courageous fight against climate change, the melting of polar ice and glaciers will continue for centuries. Cities like London, are threatened with relocation and the Netherlands with evacuation. The Netherlands, he said, will fight against rising sea levels as desperately as Bangladesh or island states in the Pacific. So in order to try to influence and inform the debate in the Netherlands, I've set up a team of undergraduate researchers and animation artists at my university. We produce animated videos that use humor to give expression to controversial and uncomfortable positions. 
For my contribution to this webinar, I'd like to share a pre-production version of a new video called, Is the Netherlands Too Deep to Fail? Just give me a moment and I will set that up. And share screen. Aha. Uh -huh. All right, getting close. Here we go. Uh, did I, uh, Welcome to- Hang on, could you hear the sound on that? Yes, all right, good. The Project Poltergeist. It works. Goodness, I shouldn't have stopped it. Just a moment. Welcome to Project Poltergeist, an ongoing series of animated videos that plumb the complexities of life below sea level. I'm Poltergeist, and I'll be your host as we peer beneath the surface in the Netherlands and other coastal regions. Because when it comes to water in the Dutch, there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. The Dutch have been gambling with the sea for centuries. The land winnings have been good, even if there were occasional busts. With storm surge barriers up their sleeves, it seemed like the game could go on forever. But there's a new game in town. Come here, big guy. If you like high stakes gambling with a whole new level of risk, this game's exactly what you're looking for. Let's check out the Dutch gambling profile. What are their strengths? They have an integrated water defense system a dedicated money stream, a fleet of world-class engineers, scientists, and architects, and a whole lot of attitude. We live in the safest delta on earth. Our dikes will protect us. That attitude may not be a strength. What about their weaknesses? 26% of the country is below sea level. An additional 34% is vulnerable to river flooding. They're so confident in their technology, the public tends to forget about risk. And that's before we add in climate change. Scientists cannot rule out the possibility of two meters of sea level rise by 2100, or five meters by 2150. Five meters. All eyes are on the Dutch as they place their bets. So big guy, how much are you in for? One million new housing units in 10 years, and we're going to build them in vulnerable areas like here and here. Now, that's what I call raising the stakes, not just because they place even more people at risk. What they're really doing is raising the stakes against themselves. New developments limit their ability to adapt. They leave no room for higher and wider dikes. They crowd out space for storing excess water. If dikes fail in densely populated, low-lying areas, mass evacuation may not be possible, and buildings could be too low for heads to stay above water. What are the Dutch thinking? To understand, we'll have to peer beneath the surface. Remember too big to fail? In 2008, American banks were teetering on the brink. One of them sank. The government bailed out the rest. They were too big to fail. What if too deep to fail is the new unspoken Dutch gambling strategy? The more assets we put in risky areas, the more likely it is the government will protect us. It's the perfect bet. We're guaranteed to win. Okay, but exactly how will the government protect you? The current plan is to raise dikes in anticipation of one meter of sea level rise by 2100, and they're well behind schedule. They'll need something more drastic than that. Maybe they'll raise the stakes and build a monumental seawall in front of the Dutch coast. A string of interconnected barrier islands, new land winnings bustling with activity, fossil fuel pumps at full throttle expelling the Rhine and the Maas into the North Sea. But won't the sea just sneak in around the German and Belgian coasts? Maybe, just maybe, without admitting it to themselves, 
the Dutch are betting on something else. Mega problems call for mega solutions. A Dutch oceanographer came up with an idea he calls NEED, the Northern European Enclosure Dam. He hopes we'll never need it. Imagine this, a dam that runs from France to England and from Scotland to Norway, enclosing the entire North Sea and the Baltic to boot. Fortress Europe. To build it requires all the sand the world uses in a year, all the sand. It's technically and financially feasible, politically iffy, diplomatically dubious, ecologically disastrous, humanly bankrupt. Is this really the path the Dutch are on? Can they still retreat from too deep to fail thinking and place bets in safer locations? There's reason to be hopeful. Research institutes and designers have added new strategy cards to the deck. The Delta Commissioner called for rules that make it difficult to place bets in vulnerable places. The government created a new cabinet post for housing and spatial planning and appointed a dapper gentleman who knows a thing or two about shoes, regardless of whether they're dry or wet. And families are thinking twice about where they want to live. Any way you look at it, climate change is in the cards and there is a lot at stake. Will the Dutch play a winning hand? We'll be watching. Thank you, that was it. Thank you so much, Simon, for the food of, for this food for thought.